Hell yeah. Hell yeah. 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 Oh, you guys are catching on. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. Um, if you guys could, like, come forward a little bit more, that'd be great. And I don't have to keep my voice too loud. I've been talking a lot today. And, you know, it's starting to get a little raspy. And I'm going to be showing a video at the end, too. And it's a little hard to hear because we don't have speakers. So the closer you all get, you know, the more cozy I'll feel. So thank you all so much for coming to this workshop and the Seed and Plant Exchange and learning about seed and getting together with our community and exercising our right to share seed and grow food. And um, yeah, this is a really, really great opportunity um, for myself to share with you what I've learned about permaculture and the techniques that are involved to make gardening easier for our own bodies, but also to help the earth heal. So in permaculture, we stack our functions so we can do a variety of, of work with, with one, you know, with one stick. So if we can tackle a lot of problems with one stick and stack our functions, then we can solve a lot of problems and have a lot more time for leisure and for planting seeds and for, fam for family time. So Hugo Culture um, is the ultimate raised garden bed. I'm Kelly Compost. Um, I do workshops on compost usually, but um, Hugo Culture is basically a soil building technique. Uh, it's coined by the Sepp Holzer from Austria. He made this technique public, and basically it's just using the patterns of nature, of, of how nature works to um, sequester carbon and fertilize and water the forests that are out there right now, because nobody's watering these forests except the rain, but somehow they stay green. So if we look at these patterns of nature, we can build sustainable food gardens with really easy steps and make our jobs easier. So it's, it's direct carbon sequestration. So if you want to get carbon out of the air, this is like the most active form you can do. Let's get out there and actively sequester the carbon. And the amazing thing is it's zero irrigation. We have a problem right now with water. California is, has one year of water left. The drought is upon us. It's only supposed to get worse. So I don't know about you, but I, my well went dry this summer. Did anybody else's wells go dry? Well, you know, I live right here in Arcata. My well went dry. So water is definitely a problem that we all face, and we're going to face more. And watering takes a long time. It's a lot of work to water my garden. And using irrigation and hosing, it's a lot of energy intensive work to get that water in the ground. But if we can keep that water in the ground with this permaculture technique and eliminate the need for watering, think about how much more time we'll have for our, the, enjoy the fruits of our labor. So zero irrigation is probably the most like, like the bells on this, this technique. But also it has other great things like um, increasing the nutrients in your soil, building soil, it becomes self-tilling because <coughs> the, the bed actually starts to create air pockets and the organisms and the biodiversity in your bed, the culture of Hugel culture, starts to take over and do the work for you. So nature has now become your biggest ally and is starting to do the work for you instead of going out there and tilling every season, watering every other day, and fertilizing. Um, it also extends your growing season because as decomposition happens within the raised bed, it creates heat. So you can grow things earlier in your season and in later into the fall and winter because of the heat that's generated from the decomposition process. It also increases the, the surface area of your arable land from going straight to raised beds. So now you're basically taking a line and putting wrinkle in it so now you're having more space to grow things in the same amount of area as you had before. <clears throat> so the basics, the basic ingredients of hula culture is you're going to want to find hardwoods, alder, madrone, oak, tan oak, things like that, deciduous, deciduous type trees that lose their leaves every winter are the best types of wood because they last the longest. They take the longest to decompose, so they're going to stick around the longest. Uh, wood that you want to avoid is um, cedar, um, 
redwood, things like that, because they have growth inhibitors, and they also take, they, they really take so much longer to decompose, and they also create these growth inhibitors that um, make your soil acidic and, uh, you know, suppress plant growth. Um, so you want some and good rotting wood, r rotting hardwood, good re fresh hardwood is the best. Furs are okay, there's a little bit of tannins in there, but once they start to decompose, they're great. So if you have any wood laying around your property, supposed to go to a burn pile, well that burn pile is going to send carbon up in the atmosphere. If you can bury it in the ground, create a carbon sequestration sink by actively engaging in carbon sequestration, you can participate in the reverse of global warming and put that carbon back in the bank, the bank of Mother Earth. You know, we need to feed her, carbon is her energy, and that wood was meant to be returned to her. So by burying this wood, you can create maximum water absorption because as the wood decomposes, it becomes a sponge. So it holds on to any water that falls on it, and it holds it there. Um, I'll be getting to show you how all the beds are built next. But if you build a small one, say about two feet tall, you have firewood lined up, cover it with soil, two feet tall. That will hold water for a few weeks, maybe two months. But if you create, the bigger you create these beds with the bigger wood that's inside it, the bigger sponges, you're going to have water holding capacity throughout the dry season. So you're going to have months and months of no, having to not water your garden. And so, you know, our dry season here lasts about two to three months. And so my hugo cultures continue to water my plants uh, through all those months um, when I can't water because my well is dry. <coughs> All right, so you can dig down a trench five feet deep, or you can do it right on the surface. There's so many different creative ways you can get with this. You can be artistic about it. It's a little bit more work to set up, but with a few friends in a, in a day or so, you can set this up and then, again, eliminate the need for watering, tilling, and fertilizing for until that wood is gone, which sometimes lasts for 30 to 50 years, depending on the size of wood that's in there. Um, combined with permaculture and polyculture, you can also eliminate um, the need to plant seeds because now you're growing s plants that seed themselves um, and enjoy the pleasure of harvesting by t eliminating all that work. So this is a diagram of what Sepp Holzer has done. You can see there. Here's the wood, big tree, lots of brush material on top of it, sticks small brush, chips, and then it's covered with soil, and this is decomposing on the inside and also holding and storing water. So this is creating heat, so allowing new varieties that you couldn't grow otherwise, creating microclimate in here, and the, the perennial plants are sinking their roots into this hardwood and eliminating the need to ever water again. And as this decomposes, it creates air pockets, so sticks and other ma organic material falls through, soil falls through, the organisms decompose that, excrete it through their, their bodies, and it, it gets deposited back on the surface, so it becomes a self-tilling bed. And um, all the beds that I've seen done with this method are incredible. They're so awesome to watch take off the first year, and then by the third year, the yield increases five times. So in Sepp's design, he likes to plant fr fruit trees in between his hugel beds or right on top of them and plant windbreaks, and now he's got orchards that he never has to water or fertilize ever again. Also, because of the steep slopes, there's no compaction. Of, well, there's little, very, very little compaction as opposed to a flat garden. Uh, you have lots of surface area, so you're compacting the soil. With this, you don't have that straight up and down compaction of gravity. You have more side, and so you have this slow decomposition, and eventually the mound shrinks, which grows beautiful soil. It also makes it a lot easier to harvest and, and weed and seed your beds because now you don't have to bend over as far. So having this, the steeper sides uh, reduces compaction and keeps your beds able to self 
uh, self-till. Are they running north and south for the sun or how are they? You can orient them any way you want. So you can have north facing slope, south facing slope, east west facing slope. You can orient your hoogles to create microclimates and plant <coughs> certain things, you know, like sun loving things on this side, more shade loving things on this side, um, taller things on the top. Uh, so you can really orient them any way you want, and you can also incorporate them into your landscape to have on-contour swales that are now hoogles. So creating a swale that has wood inside of it is not is o gonna, only going to keep that water on your property lo as long as possible by storing that water in the wood. So here's what it looks like in one month. You stack the wood and you cover it with about a foot of soil. You plant it and seed it right away with cover crops and polycultures. And one year the wood starts to decompose. You can see mycorrhizae activity coming in here. Great for perennial growth. You have annuals in here. Two years later, the wood's almost gone. It's nice and spongy now. You can see the roots are really infiltrating here. The perennials are taking off. And by 20 years, you have this beautiful mound of soil. So you're, you're, you're only going to have beautiful soil as an end result. And you can see biodiversity is key. So this culture inside of here is what Google culture is all about, is creating that community of biodiversity that's going to do the work of nature for you. It's going to <coughs> flourish because that's what nature likes to do. So here's you know, a great example. If you've got old wood sitting around, perfect. Google it. Easy. This is like one of the easiest ways to do it is line it up. I would put cardboard under it first to kind of kill the grass off, cover it with soil, and seed it right away. So you get a cover crop established, and that keeps other competitors like grass from growing in it. Other people, you know, you can take uh, raised bed ideas, put wood inside of it first, some mulch, and then soil on top. There you go, you've just installed your irrigation system. Another way to do it, this guy, he just took half his soil out, put some wood in there, put the soil back. Now he's got an irrigation system. Tr planting a fruit tree. You want to plant an irrigation system with it that you don't have to go out and water your sapling until it's four or five years old. Here you go, install an irrigation system. Okay, you're going to have about, you know, foot of soil on top of that so the roots do have soil to get into and once they tap into that wood they're going to be set. Here's an artistic hoogle, it's like a, a keyhole design. You can see there's big wood in here covered with branches and sticks so people can come in here and harvest and have a nice lovely little day in the garden. Here's another artistic hoogle so it's creating you know um, uh, an art like aesthetic pleasure when you go out and you harvest your things you kind of meander and walk around and so you can kind of get lost in here and enjoy being in your garden. Urban hugel culture, taking big wood, putting in a medium, covering it with sticks and horse compost and mulch and then soil. Now they don't have to water that anymore. Isn't that great? Um, now on contour hugels are great because um, this is <clears throat> Just do, do you all know what con con contour means or, okay, contour, I think I have some slides actually. Yeah, so um, contour lines are um, topography. So if you have a mountain, like, okay, so this is all the same elevation right here. This is all 600 feet. This is all uh, 540 feet. This is all uh, 400 feet and then 300 feet down here from sea level. So this is all straight across. So this is where beautiful permaculture patterns come into nature. So if you have a mountain, you're going to have these nice contour lines like this. Right? You have another mountain here. Those contour lines are going to go like that. So from space, you're going to see this. You're going to see this wiggly design. And you're going to see this. But if you're looking straight at it, it's actually going to be a straight line because it's all one elevation. So it's exactly level in elevation. So if water were to flow in a leveled fashion, it's going to, water is going to be distributed all along this line. And it's going to follow all this line here all the way across. So you can have plants all the way here uh, across your elevation lines. 
So that's a beautiful way of describing how permaculture um, techniques and patterns overlap of like nature and, and human patterns of a straight line and a squiggle line. It's a beautiful intersection. So you can have these swales and you find the swales by using an A-frame. Basically you walk it along and you have a plumb line and right here you put a level in there with one of those little bubbles. And so you basically walk this around until you find where it's perfectly level. And it will be a squiggly line. It won't be a straight line unless you're looking at it from exactly uh, horizontal. So you'll find these nice contour lines in your yard and that's where water is going to collect. So swales is a way of keeping water on your property, slowing it down and spreading it and sinking it into the ground. But if you incorporate wood into your swale, it's going to keep that water there longer rather than eventually just running down and into the, the groundwater. So this is a great way of using an A-frame to find the, the contour lines of your property. You dig the ditch, you add a, a Google in. So this <coughs> slows it down, it sinks it, spreads it out, and it soaks it up into that wood. So this way you can have a vineyard that you never have to water. You can have a, some, a, a cultivated crop out in the mountains of Willow Creek that you don't have to water, fertilize, or till ever again. Large scale hugel cultures, these are the ones that last, you know, throughout the dry season. They can last uh, several months without any irrigation. Um, I'll show you a video on that. I started playing around with this in my yard a couple of years ago. Started small with just apple pruning, small branches, and it, it, every year it got better and better. So I was like, all right, I'm going to keep doing bare wood. So here's one of my, the, one of the small ones I started, some firewood, spongy wood, fresh cherry wood, fresh cherry branches, fresh mulch from the cherry chip, uh, more mulch, and then just covered it with soil, which created a nice mound. This was one month later. You can see I have volunteer <coughs> squash and amaranth and chard, uh, lettuce in here. Uh, so I went bigger. I did a, a heart-shaped Google in my yard. Um, these these trees here are you know, about this big around. So this was as big as me and my neighbors could get, actually, with manpower. And this is carbon sequestration in action right here. So a pig wood covered with sticks. We put horse levels of horse poop and manure um, and native soil because the native soil is really deficient in nutrients. And so that horse manure adds quick release of nutrients, biodiversity, adds the bacteria, food for the worms, and it kickstarts that decomposition process immediately. And by having the small sticks mixed with chip, lots of chip here you can see, there's quick release of nutrients and energy. So the, this, this big carbon is not sucking up any nitrogen, which carbon can do, large carbon sources. So now there's long-term source of food and quick source of food, ensuring its success. So here's layering it up. And this summer, uh, it rained. Last summer, it rained once. It was like a sprinkle for two days. And that was like, th this was our driest year on record. And they said, it's going to get worse. So I ran out there in that little misty two days, and I planted seeds, put a little firm compost on top, just to really ensure their success. And this was three le weeks later without irrigating, just letting the rain do it. Two months later, I had another volunteer squash pop out of my compost and cover crop of bell beans, fava beans, um, vetch, red crimson clover, um, and I also had um, some perennials I put in here, thyme, and some amaranth, and um, annuals like chard, and um, some that red Russian kale. You can see I got squash out of it, I got amaranth out of it, I got bell, uh, beans, here's my perennial thyme growing out of there. And this was all without watering. Uh, so I know, now I've tried it. Let's try just putting it on the ground. The, uh, of course, being over aged or pressure doesn't matter. That was still fresh. This, you know, but I had soil on top of it. Right. 
So now, I, and I and I also plugged it with worms. I took worms out of my compost pile and stuck them in there to really inoculate it and get it going. So that was this its first season. This is was its very first season, and that was just walking away after I planted the seeds. Okay, <laughs> and and now it's going to increase every. It's going to get better and better every season. So it's 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 a r miraculous invention in nature. Um, you ever heard of nurse logs in the forest? That's where plants like to grow is on a nurse log. It's an old tree that's fallen down and now roots can sink into it where it's moist and there's nutrients available. Um, Try this one out. We just put wood right on the ground. Again, put cardboard down first to like suppress the grass. And then we added a um, big wood, smaller wood, smaller wood, smaller wood branches, horse manure. And then we took sod from this plot here in bricks. We put our shovel in and actually made square bricks of soil, turned them upside down to grass side down, and started to um, pile them up on the perimeter, the bottom first, just kind of like building an igloo. And then chunks on top of that, then we went chunked on top of that, all the way around until we finally got into the center and we had this mound of medium to grow on. So now, before I had, you know, five <coughs> feet of growing surface, now I have almost 10 feet of growing surface. You see how it's increasing the, the area of my land? And also, this is on contour with my garden. So eventually I'll have another one over here, and I'll have a walkway, and then another one that comes over here, and create these small little sections until I have my on contour hoogled swales to catch every drop of water and hold it there, ensuring my success through climate change. So, yeah, I don't want to work harder. I got a lot to do. So now here's the cover crop coming up. And you can see I've got another kugel going on in the background. And now this is all flowers coming up back here. Uh, so I just I create one hoogle by making another one. So every time I'm digging, I'm making another hoogle, putting that wood soil on top of wood. Uh, here's at CCAT. I teach an organic gardening class at CCAT on Tuesdays. That's a 10-week course every semester. It's through Extended Ed. And um, we have a greenhouse right here. And so we are getting a lot of heat from this greenhouse, creating a microclimate right here. And so we decided we we're going to dig down for this one because we don't want to obscure the plants inside this greenhouse. So we're digging down. We dug about two and a half feet down. And then we put in big, big pieces of log, old rotting wood, some fresh, but mostly it was rotten down in here. So here's our carbon sink, sequestering carbon. And then we put smaller, you know, we start big and then we start putting smaller branches in, then smaller and smaller and smaller until we have sticks mulch, horse manure, and more and more mulch until we'll see if this is nicely mulched here. We could have gone even higher, but it was getting the end of the day and we were running out of uh, organic matter. So we took that soil that we took out of the bed, which was clay. It was pretty much pure clay, a little bit of sand, very compacted, no earthworms at all. And we mixed it with, with finished compost, put it back on top in a nice mound, I mean, in this picture, it's hard to see, but the cover crop is coming up. So we like to seed it immediately because it, the soil is nice and loose. So it really drives those seeds into the ground. And we put hay on top of it to keep it moist. So when the rain comes, the seeds are going to stay moist enough to germinate and not dry out. Basically, in permaculture, you, you don't want to ever have bare soil. So always keep your soil protected from, from moisture loss and sun and keep those critters moist down there so they can have something to eat too and pull down and, and till the soil for you. So here it is, about a month later, the cover crop coming up. Um, we have oat, uh, rye, crimson clover, vetch, pea. And we also put in some perennials for the bees. We are turning this, eventually it's going to be a perennial uh, pollinator garden. So the students are then there planting right now. And then we also incorporated mushroom logs. This is Nemeco on alder. And these are from uh, Levon Pungaya Farms. He's out on the floor. And so 
They like to be buried horizontally, and they also like heat and moisture. So in a hugel bed, there's heat and moisture. So we incorporated another food source, and it, it's, kind of, it's a beautiful, um, aesthetically pleasing um, way to incorporate food into your, your growing medium. You can see that the oak and the rye is really tall now. It's about to, ready to compost. So what, what we do is we do either chop and drop or a pull and drop method, where we take all the green that we, is just a cover crop, you know, we want to keep the perennials in there. So we cut it and drop it down or we pull it. But by cutting it, we keep the roots in the soil so it can continuously pump sugars into the soil and feed the, the uh, biological activity in the soil. So, um, but now that we have the green on top in compost, we always do green and then brown. And that green can actually lose nitrogen by off-gassing. So you can see it's mostly what you see is brown is because where we put the green down, we put hay on top of it. So now we're starting to layer and build soil on top of our hugel culture. And you can see, so now it's pretty much all been mulched with its own cover crop and hay covering the nitrogen so we don't lose that nitrogen. And we can see the perennials back here getting space. And now we have all this space to plant annuals in, which we've, we're doing now. The Numeco logs are starting to take off. They're starting to colonize, and we covered those with hay also to keep them moist. So to recap, Google culture is zero irrigation, self-tilling, self-fertilizing. It builds soil, extends your growing season because the bed is generating heat, creating a microclimate. It increases the surface area of your productive land and the drought is here, so make one today. We have probably a few more good rainstorms before the drought of, of our dry season comes. So the sooner you get that wood in the ground and soaking up this rain, then the, the sooner your hugel culture get, begins to start and you get to stay, yay, I don't have to water anymore. Um, so if you see wood, say hugel it. You know, uh, I see like beautiful wood now. Like they just chopped down these beautiful elm trees at Stewart Park on J Street. I'm like, oh my god! I mean, give it a proper burial at least. You know, those trees were like five feet in diameter. They should get a proper burial. So, I, you know, Christmas time, I started getting you know our, my family and encouraging other families to bury the Christmas trees. Like, give it a proper burial. You know, don't send it to the dump. Google it. Put that carbon back into the earth. She's really, really deprived of the carbon for her own energy. So it's like putting money in the bank, in the carbon bank, because the whole economy of nature runs on carbon. And so right now it's all in the air. You gotta put it back in the earth. So I think that's about it. Thank you. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show a video here real quick. And uh if you can't hear it, come closer. This is uh, the video that got me excited. as high as it goes. This is where I want to get to, building these big ones. Oops. Uh-oh. Shouldn't have pushed that. Climates are like even better to do it. Here is nearly a kilometer of Google culture beds. That prevents erosion by having these branches there and by seeding it right away that will prevent it from eroding by having that cover crop in there. It's a technique. Yeah. Once these Google culture beds get to be about three years old, the plant growth will probably be yeah, yield increases five times after three years. 
because now the culture has had those th couple of years to really build their subway systems and build their, you know, their streets and their their communities. All the uh, biodiversity Be has been able to integrate. Mm -hmm. So this is all unirrigated Hugo culture. And look in the background. The hillsides are brown. This is in Montana. So this is all unirrigated, just because of that wood holding water. I was at this place two years ago. Yeah? Yeah. I nice. just put those in. No way. That's yeah. awesome. I just realized that I will. Oh, oh, so cool. <laughs> so cool. You know, it's safe to say that the plants that haven't gone through any of this irrigation are, are still extremely vital. And even in the hot time of this year, when you look at all the properties around and their barley fields and, and even some of the alfalfa fields are, are brown, this area has been, been vital and green throughout all of the summer. The recipe is wood and brush covered with soil. That's Seth Holzer, he's Austrian, he coined his phrase. sustainable systems with earth ingredients. And now you're basically foraging. Depending on which aspect that the culture is facing, it elicits different qualities in the different kinds of plants that grow. Um, and for the plants that grow on the north side, uh, regard, uh, I guess a few examples are the radishes, the peas, the lettuces, the carrots, they're particularly sweet. And on the things that grow on the southwest, they have a lot more of a bite to them. And lettuce and, and that bite is bitterness and mustard, it's, it's hotness. Um, and these are, are another great example. On the north side, they're extremely tender and sweet. But on the south side, I would describe them as um, mealy and almost protein. So you get that the south side of the slope produces more like heat and bite and flavor and like protein but the north side is like more sweet and crisp and juicy so I just wanted to show you that video to give you more examples and go for it you know build the big ones go for the big ones I'm going to be hoping to build some big ones with Dan Marr in the future going out to Hoopa and, and building them in the community so we can all benefit by having these self-sustaining, perpetuating, permaculture technique, land and soil generating systems. So thank you so much. <laughs> Go out, Google it, share it with the world, and, and make, make it work. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.